So uh, we'll we'll uh, move to the second part of our uh, presentation. Uh, we'll talk about special. So 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 the broader topic was how we can use special situations and options to improve pro portfolio alpha. So we'll talk about special situations now. Uh, continue on this for half an hour, and then take a break. And then options uh, is a topic we'll take after the break. So standard disclaimer, this is only for educational purposes. We don't have any clients and uh, we don't, uh, we're not recommending anything. So, so the big question is what is a special situation? Uh, it's a term that many of you may not be familiar with. And uh, so, <coughs> so a special situation is a terminology that uh, uh, Benjamin Graham used in his uh, seminal book. Uh, and uh, he basically highlighted it as uh, a opportunity which yields a satisfactory profit and uh, which whose returns are not related to what is happening in the general market. So, so one, the returns are uncorrelated and there is a high probability of uh, that uh, playing out over a period of time. So there is uh, also this Investopedia definition where, where a special situation refers to, to <coughs> circumstances uh, involving a security which would compel investors to trade uh, purely based on that special situation which uh, I would also highlight is a corporate action. So, so that corporate action itself uh, drives a particular opportunity to make money. So there is one guy, Morris Schiller, who wrote a book, who was a practitioner, and uh, he, he slight, uh, wrote a slightly more technical aspect uh, of special situations. So, <coughs> so special situations are not about uh, esoteric or uh, qualitative facts. It's driven by actual numbers and timelines involved in a certain <laughs> transaction to, to, to get. So. <coughs> So as he said, special situation investors want to know where the real is and uh, not where uh, the fancy thought process is playing out. And uh, the, the biggest benefit of investing in special situations is that uh, you can make larger allocations and you can assign much higher probabilities of success to the outcome. So, so again, so breaking up the special situations into the various aspects, uh, uh, it's driven by a corporate action. So, so corporate action, if a company is acquiring a company, if a company is getting demerged out of an entity, uh, if there's a rights issue, if there's a, there's a buyback that is involved. So all these are various aspects, offer for sale, all these are various aspects that are part of that. Uh, the risk reward can be meaningfully impacted. Say, uh, coming back to the, the most basic of that, say a company is being taken over, there's an open offer for that company. So you know the price at which the open offer is there. And generally uh, what happens is the, the, op uh, the open offers typically come at a price that is higher than the price at which the security is trading at. So, so the basic premise of a special situation is you buy from the market, you tender in the open offer, and uh, whatever shares come back, you sell in the market. And uh, so, so there is a timeline involved in it. Uh, the entire timeline will be defined by uh, whatever the SEBI regulations are and whatever time it takes to take the approvals. And uh, so, so there is a closure date to the entire transaction. Once the closure date comes, you do complete the transaction, you know how much money you made or lost in the entire transaction. The other big, big aspect is that the returns in a special situation are just not linked to the overall <coughs> market returns. The, the, the returns are totally, un, uh, I wouldn't say totally uncorrelated, but not very correlated with the, the market returns. So, so just by investing money in special situations, you are kind of, putting money in a different asset class altogether. So, uh, and uh, it, there is always an exit. If any situation doesn't say that there is not, uh, you don't know when you have to exit, uh, then it uh, really would not be a special situation. Next. So, so the, uh, we have just tried to articulate uh, the various aspects. So mergers, demergers, rights issues, open offers, uh, buybacks, uh, delisting, offer for sale, warrants, capital reduction, large payouts, convertibles, IPOs. Uh, 
IPOs used to be a special situation and I'll, uh, the, the construct around uh, that is, I would not call it a special situation given the current construct. So, so just a bit about uh, the various categories and what happens. So merger is when two companies decide uh, to merge together in, and become one company. And uh, the, uh, the time duration uh, could be, uh, historically it was uh, less than a year, but lately it's been uh, taking longer, uh, especially after COVID, the approval process has uh, taken longer. And the expected return range is what I have experienced uh, doing it. Uh, the actual returns could be a lot different from this, but this is where uh, my experience has been. So in mergers, uh, in case the acquiring company is in the FNO segments, which uh, implies that you can short the security, the acquiring security, then that particular trade becomes much more, uh, the, the surety of outcome is 100% in that case. Then uh, the, the probability that you will make a loss is extremely low. So, so I specifically look at the cases where in mergers, uh, the acquiring company is in the FNO segment. So demergers is when one company decides to, to hive off a division and list it separately. Uh, <clears throat> rights issue is when uh, the company aims to raise more money from its existing shareholders. And uh, why the opportunity lies in the rights issue is because <coughs> under the current regulations, uh, if there is a rights issue uh, of a company and uh, all the shareholders may not choose to apply to a rights issue, then whatever the remaining pool is that, and normally the rights issue is always at a discount to the market price. Otherwise, uh, the money would not be raised. So, so it's at a discount to the price, and uh, if other shareholders do not choose to, to <coughs> apply in the rights issue, then the, the remaining shareholders uh, would have a entitlement on that in case they choose to apply more. So, so that is where the delta can be created by applying to rights issues. So open offer is uh, the current regulations are if any company gets taken over, then uh, then with the change of management, uh, SEBI mandates that all the other minority shareholders should also have an exit option. So that determines an open offer. So, so open offer is the most common special situation uh, which we have practiced over the, and the most opportunities come in that particular area. Buyback tenders is again, uh, this is again SEBI guidelines have determined that uh, <laughs> what has happened is that now dividends are taxed and uh, for companies uh, to return money back to the shareholders, tender buybacks make, make much more sense than, uh, than uh, paying out dividends. So a lot of companies now uh, announce uh, tender buybacks and uh, the opportunity in tender buybacks is largely uh, because there's a reservation for smaller shareholders in tender buybacks, less than shareholders whose uh, portfolio of holding value is less than two lakhs. There is a separate reservation for that. And because of that, the acceptance rates on those uh, tender buybacks are uh, usually higher for the retail. And again, tender buybacks are typically at a price higher than the market price uh, because they want to encourage people to, to, to participate in that. Otherwise, it will not be successful, so. So, <laughs> Uh, offer for sale uh, is basically a mechanism where the existing shareholders of a company can sell in the market. Uh, normally these offer for sales come at a discount to the prevailing market value. So the whole idea is uh, bid in those uh, discounted prices and then aim to sell in the, in the market. And uh, there is a small delta that can be generated. So while the deltas here are pretty small in offer for sale, but the entire, your profit can be booked, uh, entire profit can be booked within two or three days. So on an annualized basis, the returns are pretty higher. So, so. so delistings are where the company is listed and when the promoter wants to delist the company. And uh, usually he has to pay a huge premium to the market price and uh, participate. But uh, delistings are pretty risky. What if the uh, discovered price of delisting and the, the promoter says that I don't want to delist and then the risks are pretty high. So warrants are uh, basically partly paid up shares or instruments that entitle people to, to buy a share at a subsequent date at a, subse at, at a predetermined price. So they, they are just like uh, ESOPs or options to speak of. They, they have a, 
long uh, maturity date and opportunities do arise in this. Large payouts is when a company has sold a division and uh, suddenly with a lot of money and uh, they, they pay out a huge dividend out of those. So, so earlier large payouts used to happen in dividends but given the current uh, taxation regime, uh, uh, these payouts will tend to be more in terms of buybacks than dividend payouts. Uh, convertibles are again instruments which are initially debt instruments, so these are convertible debentures. So initially they, they pay <coughs> interest on, on them and, and at, after a certain point they can be converted into equity. So convertibles are not so prevalent in India, uh, they are much more prevalent in uh, US and the other markets. Uh, but again, this is a big opportunity. So, so why a special situation? So, so for us, it's a proxy to hold cash or debt. So I would never want to lie, uh, keep my money in debt or cash. I'd rather have that. So, so it's a clear-cut proxy for uh, us to, to hold it. So <laughs> while an individual transaction in a special situation might result in a negative uh, return, on an overall basis, uh, the, the portfolio of investments we do in special situations, there's hardly a negative, there's never been a negative year. So, so and, and the number of transactions that result in a negative return is also pretty low. So, and why, and the returns are much better than holding cash or debt. Uh, special situations also create, uh, sometimes give you good opportunities to, to, to uh, find long-term ideas. Uh, Siddharth will talk about this subsequently, but it's, it's a good fertile ground for you to look at uh, some of your long-term investing ideas. Also, I started special situations is also it takes care of your hyperactivity where once you have uh, invested in a portfolio of stocks and you're doing it for the long term, there's nothing else to do, then what do you do with your time? So rather than trying to, to, to trade your stocks, it's better to do something like this. So now I've also found options, but it takes care of the hyperactivity or that edge to, edge to do something. It takes care of that. Uh, the other big advantage is that sometimes, uh, especially if the stock is in FNO, you can do large allocations. In my individual case, I, in one of the trades, I've invested close to 50% of my net worth because I was so sure of the outcome. So, so this plays out and I know other people who take leverage in order to do these investments also. So practitioners in special situations, uh, uh, Buffett has done it a lot in his earlier avatar. Now his size is so big because it doesn't make, it doesn't move the needle so he doesn't do it. Benjamin Graham talked about it, Joel Greenblatt, his, he has a famous book, uh, You Can Be a Stock Market Genius is again a great book about special situation investing. In India, the practitioner, uh, Professor Bakshi used to do it initially. He stopped doing it now. Rashesha Edelweiss, uh, again, in his personal capacity, he does a lot. And uh, there's uh, one uh, gentleman called Ashok Agarwal, so Globe Pavel, the Delhi-based guy, he's also pretty big in this space. The other people, uh, but they, they choose to stay private, so, so, but there are enough other people who, who do this. So I'll, I'll go through a, a few brief examples. Uh, I don't want to go into too much detail because uh, then the discussion will be endless. So this was, uh, Escorts was taken over by a Japanese company called Kubota. And uh, <clears throat> there was an open offer uh, uh, from the public shareholders. So typically the open offer is 26%, uh, but in their case it was for a higher amount because some of the shares were getting, existing shares were getting cancelled. It was an employee trust hold held them and the plan was to cancel them. So the percentage uh, turned out to be a higher. So, so uh, basically these are the, the timeline was, it was announced on uh, 18th November. The price was 1640. Uh, the open offer at which uh, they were willing to buy the shares was 2000. So, and uh, so these are the timelines. And uh, acceptance ratio is how many of the shares that you tendered actually got accepted. And because this was an FNO, so, so you could always hedge uh, whatever shares are not going to be accepted, or whatever your estimate is about the acceptance ratio, you can hedge by shorting the futures for those shares. 
So, so if you can see that the total return, the trade, uh, so this is one version of it. Uh, they, because it's an FNO, there are multiple ways to play it out. This is one way if you simply did without any hedging or anything. So it generated a 15% return on an annualized basis. It was a 38% return. Next. So uh, is the calculation of estimated acceptance ratio the way you calculate is similar to buyback? So, see, uh, the acceptance ratio is actually what happened. Yeah. But what we try to do is we model out. There is a theoretical acceptance ratio. Say, the open offer is for 26%, uh, the float is 52%. When I say float is all the minority shareholders put together who, are, who can tender in that open offer. If it's, say, 52%, your theoretical acceptance ratio is 50%. But the practical acceptance ratio is always better than that, theoretical, because not everybody will tender. Earlier, people didn't tender because they weren't aware about that such a situation was there. But now, uh, the, that, uh, uh, that level of ignorance is much lower in the market. Uh, so, so the people consciously then decide. But there is a set of people who say that uh, Escorts has been taken over by Kabuta uh, uh, and I like the new owners and I want to stay. Uh, now the future prospects are even better. I would like to hold on. So he will not tender. So because of that, your actual acceptance ratio will always be higher than the theoretical acceptance ratio. How much higher is what will determine your overall return? So that is where the, the modeling and uh, our historical experience has comes into play. So, uh, see, as soon as uh, this thing uh, is announced, the first set of people who want to buy the share are the set of arbitrages like me. So, people like me will want to buy the share from the market. Now, once we start buying, the share price starts going up. Say, say it's from 1640, it goes up to 1700, 1800. We know the acceptance is not going to be 100%. So as soon as it starts approaching closer to 2000, I'll be the first guy to sell because I, I am not playing it for the long term potential. I'm just playing for this transaction. So as it starts approaching 2000 at a certain point, I know if my modeling says the acceptance is 70% and the residual price I've uh, modeled it out, I will always be a seller below 2000. So, so then our supply will start coming into the market. And like me, there are, are thousands of people out there. So. so as a category, these arbitrages are very different from, uh, their behavior is very different from that of a long investor. Next one. So, so this is another one that recently played out. Max India, uh, <coughs> they, they said that they will buy back 20% of their equity at a predetermined price of 85 rupees. Uh, they announced it in 2020, but the actual transaction materialized in August of 22. And uh, so, so the announcement was August 22. But the record day, because of all the approval that they required for doing this, they, it only came uh, uh, <coughs> after 22 months. So even on 27 July, so that's what I'm saying that the week previous to that. And now, so what happens is the record date itself gets notified about 10 to 15 days before the actual record date. So, so there is an opportunity to buy and we are saying that we bought at that price. And so it was saying that the market price was 75.7 and uh, the uh, buyback price was 85 bucks. And uh, the, it highlights uh, the kind of returns we made. So, so we made a 11% return on the transaction, but on an annualized basis, given the amount of days that our money was invested, the annualized returns are more than 100%. So it's a, uh, basically what they're saying is that uh, we have more money that we want to hold in the company. So we are willing to buy out the other minority shareholders at a certain price. It's a convoluted way of doing things. They could have simply d d d done a tender buyback, but there was a tax application. By doing this process, the tax implication uh, reduces dramatically. But because of this, the approval process took almost two years for this. 
So this is the first case I came across of a buyback. Normally, this doesn't happen. So, uh, okay, so Indian hotels are uh, rights issue and uh, here again uh, in a rights issue if the company is an FNO it's easier to play uh, and uh, this is again so, so it highlights all the uh, various aspects. So and since we have it was an FNO while the actual return we made was 3.5% but the period over which we made uh, the return the annualized returns then uh, is almost 800%. Uh, so, and, and this is just one version of the returns. We, we sold a lot of options also on this. So, so there are multiple ways to play it out. We are just doing one iteration of what we did. So again, <laughs> Patanjali Foods, uh, yeah. yeah. For Indian hotels, can you detail the, how you use futures and options? Or you want yeah, to so, so, so again, uh, we have a large part of things to cover. So we don't want to jump. We, uh, once the session is over, we can talk about uh, individually. Actually, I'm saying that only because you can hedge from the futures and options market, that is what makes you more confident about getting into these special businesses. So, so yeah, uh, so, so um, options play a much bigger role more so in uh, uh, open offers than in, uh, than in rights issues. So a case in point, if you want to highlight, say, Ambuja. Ambuja open offer was there from the Adani group. So open offer uh, was at 385 bucks. The stock was trading at 360 on the day when the announcements came in. So rather than buying the share at 360 because it was an FNO, what we decided to do was uh, we decided to sell the 350 strike puts. Now, not all of you would be aware about uh, how the option structures work, but uh, but we. Is, sold the 350 strike put at almost 4 bucks that day. So whatever we can sell. What happens is that once those corporate actions happen, uh, the, the premiums shrink dramatically. So, so it's the fastest fingers first, those who can sell. But uh, it's another up way of looking at uh, how you can do things. So it's an entirely different way of doing things. But I would uh, be the happiest if uh, those open offers come in shares where, uh, which are in the FNO segment. So there the opportunities are uh, countless. So Patanjali Food again was a listed company. Uh, there was an offer for sale which was at a discount to the shares. Uh, so, so price on the date of the uh, offer for sale was 855 and the price uh, offer for sale was coming at 650. So it was literally kind of a no brainer to, to and simply if you would uh, apply at the cutoff. I, uh, so we were able to, to apply to that and because of the controversy that happened is uh, SEBI, there were a lot of text messages asking people to subscribe. SEBI got into action and saying that uh, it, it, it will give everybody the right to withdraw their application because uh, it seems that the manipulation seems to be happening. And because of that, a, a sort of uh, many people got afraid. They withdrew their applications, and uh, because of that, uh, whatever you applied for, you got. And there was a straightaway 30% delta once the shares got listed, and all of this played out in a matter of 15 days. And so, so you see the annualized returns that can play out. So the next one. You mentioned that uh, you can bid to the broker. Yeah, yeah. So you can bid through the broker or no? works even for discount brokers. Yeah, yeah. Discount brokers also, they just... I think there's some confusion over there. I think there's some confusion over This is a regular IPO. No, this is not a regular IPO. It was a regular IPO. No. We bid it through ASBA. Pardon? We applied through ASBA. Ah, so you can do through the ASBA, no? ASBA, like it's a normal IPO. We didn't go through the broker. We went through the bank itself. That is also an opportunity. Yeah. 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 So, so it was an offer for sale, but it it uh, the, uh, the bids went. Uh, huh? FPO. Ah, sorry. So uh, you can say this is uh, rather than an offer for sale, it's an FPO. But the share was listed out there. Existing share listed. Yeah. And uh, there was arbitrage. It was uh, like people said it manipulated because of the low protein stock at all. Uh, so uh, people were skeptical. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, so this was uh, more like a FPO rather than offer for sale. Yeah. 
So again, this was a, uh, these opportunities don't come often, but uh, in this case, what happened was Tata Steel came out with a rights issue, and uh, for one set of the rights issue, uh, they offered partly paid shares. Now they said that only pay us 25% of those shares uh, upfront, and within the next one year, we will call for the remaining money. So that was the opportunity was. These rights issue shares came at uh, 615 rupees when the share price itself was closer to above 800. Now, uh, after that, subsequent to that, the share price fell dramatically and uh, the share actually went below 615. And because of that, uh, <coughs> uh, 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 the, the rights issue itself came out of money. So. So once the price uh, came below 615, there was no point uh, calling the remaining 75% because people would not pay for it. Even adjusting for the 146 rupees they, they had paid uh, upfront. So, so because of that, uh, what they did was they extended the rights issue uh, deadline from, uh, they kept on extending it by a year, year, and they uh, continued this for almost four years. And so what effectively th and that created was, it created a long dated uh, call option on the stock uh, where the uh, price of the call option was much lower. See, we tend to think everything in terms of option, whether, whether there is an opportunity to buy. So this created a call option on the uh, Tata Steel share, uh, which had a life of, uh, while we did not know then, but we knew that as long as it's below the underlying price, it will keep on getting extended. So, <clears throat> so there were two trades to it. One was when the rights issue was applied, uh, which is generated. Uh, <clears throat> so what happened is, uh, is uh, because the share price had fallen, once those partly paid trade shares got listed and they traded, they hit the down circuit. And at buying at those shares at the down circuit effectively, even adjusting for the money that you had to pay on those partly paid shares, you were still buying them cheaper than the actual share. So you could buy these shares and just short the futures of the shares and, and you lock the profit right up front. So that was one opportunity that happened because of the peculiarities of the market on that particular day. The other opportunity that uh, I uh, talk about, so partly paid shares were in the money call options with a strike price of 461 and expiring in, uh, sorry, I have written in the money, it should be out of money, call option with a strike price of 461 and expiring in March 2019. So, and uh, during the meltdown of uh, March 2020, uh, this was subsequently uh, extended to March 21. So in March 2020, you could have bought these shares at 29 bucks and uh, just played uh, for the revival in the share price, which actually happened and these 29 rupees shares actually uh, moved to 275 before the call for getting them converted into shares came in. So it was a 10x return on these uh, shares. Uh, this was one of the biggest return generators for us during the COVID time because we, we understood as a out of money call option, which many people would not think of it like that. At uh, 29 bucks, it went as low as 29 rupees. From 154, it went to 29. Yeah. <coughs> Pardon? Yeah. So, so again, uh, Gulf Oil Lubricants was another company that demurred. I, I won't go to you know the nitty gritty. This was uh, this is happened a long time back. But uh, I'll just ask you to highlight the returns. The actual trade returns were also 160 percent on this, because. Uh, uh, the company that came out of this demerger, they it traded at a huge premium. It was highly profitable with ROEs of upwards of 50%. But those ROEs were not seen when it was part of a larger company. So Strides Acro Labs, again, they, they sold their main business and they, uh, the share was at 865 and they, they paid out a 500 rupees dividend. This was at a time when the dividend was not taxed at the, uh, uh, for, at the point of recipient. And, uh, so, so I'm just talking about the actual transaction closer to that. Uh, uh, the return wasn't so great as I thought initially, but on an annualized basis, it still paid out very well. 
SR uh, oil is a delisting case. Uh, again, the delisting <coughs> returns uh, weren't so great. <coughs> Uh, what happened was in SR case, uh, they, they built a book at a certain price, I think it was 80 to 83 rupees. So delisting had a certain amount of returns. But after doing the delisting, uh, what happened was they sold their company to, to a Russian company uh, at a huge premium at uh, 262.8. And uh, this happened within uh, a couple of months of the delisting actually happened. So then SEBI interjected and said that all the minority shareholders uh, who participated in the delisting should also get that price. And because of that, uh, <coughs> you could have bought all the shares you wanted. It was highly liquid and uh, available. The returns on that particular transaction were closer to 200% on an absolute basis. So another one was that uh, VSNL, uh, their uh, hemisphere properties, their, their real estate uh, spin-off that happened. So while the transaction, Tata Group bought that company, uh, it was always under the assumption that uh, the real estate portion, the ownership lies with the minority shareholders of Ta of VSNL uh, uh, and the government. So finally, when they finally got the approval to to get the demerger, so 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 all the people who attended in the open offer that that uh, value of the real estate uh, company was not factored in they finally got the shares uh, almost after 15 years but that gave a big delta so special situations uh, buffett has also played their specific case histories i won't go, go into the details uh, but uh, we'll share the presentation you can see how buffett has played these out over a period of time so in terms of the literature uh, uh, basically, these are the two books that are out there. Uh, Joel Greenblatt, I refer to this guy. The number of blogs there are also out there that talk about this. And then Morris Schiller, there's an old book that is out there. So, I'll have talked about the positive. The downside is, uh, it does require a lot of work. Uh, you, you have to create a list of all the special situations that are out there uh, in the market. You have to track the timelines involved and when the record dates come. Uh, so you have to act, if you're not actively tracking, you will miss those deadlines and not do things. <coughs> so, so that tracking has to be done. So anybody who's not doing it full time will find it a bit difficult. Uh, the effort put in studying a particular, what, like what you did in escorts, it's very contextual to that particular transaction. So, so it doesn't, uh, unlike investing, the knowledge doesn't compound. So whatever time and effort you put in, uh, it is only for that particular transaction. It won't uh, uh, count for much in subsequent trades. Uh, what we have realized is the returns reduce as the size of the portfolio increases. The returns which you historically used to make, uh, and the, those returns are no longer there. So the returns uh, decrease as the portfolio increases. The other thing is, uh, uh, as, as uh, this particular strategy, especially buyback tenders, now even the brokers offer to all this, uh, say a TCS or a Wipro or an Enfi buyback, the brokers are offering it as a product to all the retail clients. So it's become so popular, where usually earlier the acceptance used to be 100% in this large now the acceptance is uh, much below 100. So there is, you run the risk of even losing money in that also. So once it becomes a crowded trade, then the returns obviously go down. It's no longer a special situation. It's a general No, no, it's still a special situation. It's just that the returns have reduced. So, uh, so again, the other aspect is while the downside is limited, the upside is also limited. You have uh, to not to kill them. So a limited ad, so you, you're trying to generate it as a, as an income in this. So especially uh, as I did analysis, uh, so so few years it definitely underperforms the broader market. Uh, so, and sometimes uh, trades uh, result in a probability like in uh, Balrampur, uh, Chini, they offered a tender buyback, I knew the acceptance is not going to be uh, very high. But post that, uh, the, the sentiment, because of certain government policies, the sentiment around uh, sugar stocks went down. 
So the stock price actually corrected 40%. So what, and the, in the tender, the acceptance ratio was not even 10%. So sometimes unexpected losses happen, like in this particular case. So, so just uh, broadly, some of the potential uh, ideas that are currently live, uh, so we just wanted to give a, we are not going to comment on the merits or demerits of any of it, but these are currently live. The Shiram City Union and Shiram Transport merger is there. The HDFC, HDFC Bank merger is there. Inox PVR merger is there. Demergers may, uh, Meza International uh, is going to demerge. Sundaram Kletam is pretty interesting. I find it interesting, but won't go into the details of it. Bombay Dying uh, announced the rights issue. So, so Open offers automotive axles. The parent company of automotive axles <coughs> globally got uh, acquired, so it's, a, it's an indirect uh, open offer. NDTV seems to be a hostile takeover, that's, uh, that's interesting. What uh, NDTV doesn't want to sell, but Adani want to take over, so. Next one. So offer for sale, uh, they are very contextual, so nothing uh, right now. Uh, buyback tender, Karware Technical Fibers, SP Apparels uh, are there. Then warrants, HDFC warrants are live. Uh, they have a live till August 23. Uh, and, uh, uh, and then that's out there. Then large play out. Sundaram Clayton uh, is uh, for every share, uh, they are going to issue <coughs> non convertible redeemable preference shares, which is uh, so equivalent to 1,160 rupees for every share. And the share is currently trading at 4,500. So yeah, largely. So in terms of, uh, to summarize in terms of our experience, I started at uh, the post uh, 2008 meltdown. I was looking at income generating strategies, so started in 2009. So again, so while we may, we may lose money in a transaction, we haven't lost money in any given year. Uh, uh, once we are confident about uh, the risk reward, we can allocate large amounts of money. I've done that historically also. Uh, the range profile is 15 to 30 percent uh, broadly, and it has been coming down. Earlier, I would have said uh, 25 to 30 percent, but uh, over the last few years, it has been coming down. Uh, so, and we are very comfortable with this portfolio. We know that uh, we will not have a negative year. And also, it's it's uh, it's an uncorrelated asset compared to to our uh, investing aspect. Uh, the other aspect is that there is a lot of rumors and announcements, and even the media highlighting ki ye hone wala hai, Adani isko khareedne wala hai. So so no, the idea is not to preempt. Then you are taking risks. The idea is only to take action once the whole thing is announced formally. So this is a lesson I learned. I, I got into something that was I was fairly confident given all the chatter on the on the media houses, but that transaction didn't materialize. So 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 if you call it special situation, don't preempt it. Only wait for the formal announcements. So this has become a pop, uh, relatively more popular than what it used to be ten years back. So returns are decreasing. So portfolio size also uh, increase, uh, as the increase in portfolio size, the returns also decrease. Uh, the other aspect what has happened is that, uh, especially post 2018, is uh, many of the special situations which we thought were opportunities uh, are no longer playing out that way. What is happening is, uh, say if a company is taken over and the open offer is announced, the, the share on the day of announcement itself crosses the open offer price. So now, once it crosses that open offer price, it's no longer a special situation. Then it's a different category altogether. So, so that that whole window of opportunity around special situation has gone down. So, so to constantly deploy money in open or in special situations is no longer possible. So it has to be more tactical than as a regular strategy. And uh, one has to, to be patient now. So, so ACC Abuja open offers were great opportunities. The, the returns are on an annualized basis are quite more than triple digit. So, and whatever capital you wanted to deploy. Gaurav, one question. So, if we, uh, have you seen this trend or uh, the community you've got a chance to analyze this in terms of other local markets? Could you repeat that? I, I, 
So I'm saying, I mean, uh, if we if we compare these trends to global markets, then do we see a parity where you know the markets, when theoretically when we say markets are becoming more efficient, so you know the the premiums on these or the returns on these are uh, special situations are actually going down. Yeah, yeah. So so that is always the case. So. So, uh, as more and more people uh, get to know about these things and uh, they start taking action, so anything that uh, becomes popular, any strategy or situation that becomes popular, the returns tend to go down, whether it is this, whether it's option trading or any, or even in investing like, uh, like ho holding companies used to be an opportunity in investing where uh, buying holding companies at a huge discount to their underlying as, uh, values. But now those kind of discounts are not seen because there are enough people who are always willing to buy at a certain price. So, so as uh, things become popular, obviously the returns go down. No seminar by Gaurav, less the return. No, no, because <laughs> yeah. So, so how would you decide which, which situation to invest in? So there, uh, right now you uh, listed a couple of situations. So how do you decide to invest in all of them? Or no, we, we study them and uh, based on merit, uh, see it also, there's an opportunity cost. So there's a certain threshold, we want the returns to be above a certain threshold. And when I say above a certain, th the probability of getting those returns should be pretty high. What returns we will finally get, we don't know. But the probability of the expected returns should, should be higher than the threshold. Otherwise, we will not take those transactions. Mm -hmm. For example, if you see Fintech plastic and Fintech industry <coughs> merger, so about five, six years back, they did, you know, they are way above, below their prices. Or even if you take ITFC first bank, mm -hmm. you know, when they merged, so, you know, there's some in case they wanted to disguise in the merger, and they did sure. after five years, they are below the price. So how to protect from these angles? So uh, that part, uh, Siddharth will talk about, uh, maybe both these cases Siddharth will refer to. There are spin-offs, uh, so demergers are spin-offs. So there are opportunities out there and that's where you wear your thinking hat and think about whether you're going to be right or wrong. So when you think about from the long term, so syntax, if you had immediately sold after the demerger, you still would have made money. Point is that if you thought about, I want to hold it on for a longer period, and that's when subsequently the frauds came up. That happened in the group. So, so. So, again, say in an open offer, uh, escorts Kabuta, open offer, uh, say I buy shares from the market, say at 1700, the tender is at uh, 2000. And uh, now, I don't know what the acceptance is. Theoretically, the acceptance was 55%. Actual acceptance came at 72%. But let's say that my modeling says that uh, acceptance will be at least 60%. Now, what happens to the 40% shares that come back? You have to tender the entire 100 for the 40 to come back. So now 40, at what price you are able to sell is, is open depending on uh, where the market price is going to be at that point. <coughs> Now, if you feel the acceptance is going to be 60%, if the stock is in FNO, I can short 40% of the, of, or 40 shows, uh, e futures equivalent to 40 shares uh, in the FNO market. So I'm not taking any risk of wh where the price uh, goes to. It may go up, and then uh, I make lesser returns than what I ought to. If it goes down, I'll make more returns than I ought to. But because I know with certainty there is a certain minimum returns I am going to get. So uh, I can do the trade which could be 20 times the size of what I do without a, a option because I am pretty sure about my downside is limited. But in, in this trade, uh, at the price which you sold, you required at least a minimum 60% I think acceptance in order to break even in that. Yeah, theoretically. Yes, okay. Huh. But the price at which you sold, I think 1595 you showed uh, yeah. that it required at least a 60% acceptance, right? No, it's, it's not a function. See, 
arbitrary judges who are acting like me are a limited audience they, they are never the majority they are a minority what is more important is that the general investors in the company they are institutional there is retail what they are thinking about it the fact that uh, kubota a japanese mnc has taken over escorts uh, most people view would turn positive post that acquisition so it's not like it this before that acquisition the stock is trading at 1800 now post acquisition it will go to 1000 so well you can always create those scenarios it's theoretically not possible that the, that's where your historical uh, experience comes into play so the worst case according to you would be in that range so so i'm saying i uh, if it, suppose it was not in fno one can still lose money on that particular transaction but uh, the what's the probability of losing that money that's pretty low gorav i want you to elaborate on what kind of timeline to get because you know at times an offer to come post market hours and maybe the next day you have to pull the trigger so i i did refer to the timelines that were historical i haven't really updated it but uh, some of the things that do can to get uh, tend shorter but uh, not not the trade playing out but when you have to so it it has to be the day after the announcements are made if it's made during market hours on the same day or if it's after, uh, announced after market hours the next day the, the biggest volumes will happen that where the arbitrages are buying out of the general shareholders so so you have to act on that particular day because uh, once uh, peop, more and more people analyze uh, the construct of the trade uh, uh, the share will further move up within a few hours i would say within a matlab aisa bhi nahi hai ki matlab ek second mein sab kuch karna hai there won't be any thumb rule in pcs as the open offer closed the price continued to fall on the day of the announcement it was way above and so that's driven by the general market sentiment na see see the general market sentiment so there is no right answer for that no no i agree to that uh, so ultimately uh, you always have to think in terms of probabilities the actual outcome could be a, a very different so so it it could be a tail event so so you you are into an open offer like there is this uh, one person i know he doesn't like to be named too often but uh, he was heavily invested in open uh, uh, in a special situations portfolio in march 2020 and uh, because of the the what happened during that period his entire year at least accounting year was negative for that year but subsequent in the subsequent 3 months he recovered all of that money so so to say ki what exactly will play out at any particular time once you are comfortable about the probabilities of how this plays out uh, you might have to bear the m2m for some period of time that's about it so uh, i'll uh, so uh siddharth will talk about uh, the investing ideas that might come out of uh, such i think i will quickly go through this so basically what we are trying to look for is ki can we find investment opportunities or ideas with asymmetric payoffs what does that mean is that our downside is somewhat limited given the kind of what are the things happening and there is a disproportionate upside possible can we find some ideas like that and i from my experience i have found that special situation for some reasons uh, tend to be a very fertile ground to look for those ideas and especially two kind of special situations are more interesting one is a management change that is uh, a new management is taking over a company so if you think about it why would someone take over a company because the new management should feel confident about the prospects of the business if you are starting a new business you are not going to do it to make small gains right you should feel confident that this business has a potential to grow significantly over time this is where you think your expertise lies this is where you are committing your time and capital to grow it and if such management had good past track record in execution whatever they have been doing then at least uh, you have a better visibility you know what could sort of potential Uh, what are what the possibilities are for the future and especially if the transaction happens at a very reasonable valuations because a lot of times what would happen is this there are small companies which have been struggling 
and they could be struggling for various reasons that the current management is so may have succession issues and is no longer focused in the business or they the current management or the business has some kind of constraints either in terms of capability of capital to grow the business or ability to attract talent because it's a small business overall and you know the group is not as reputed and it's difficult to attract talent and all these are solvable problems right and if you have competent and you know capable management who comes in and takes a large stake and is committed to solving these problems then this undervaluation could actually become you know is is a catalyst there it could become create a opportunities for asymmetric payoffs in future and similarly there is another category called spin offs when a small segment of a company is being demerged from a larger company uh then sometimes what happens is irrespective of the fundamentals of the business the large institutional holders are not interested in holding a very small position because it is meaningless for their rent portfolios so they as per their mandate and have various requirements they would sell it indiscriminately of the valuation or the prices they would just sell it off because it's a very small part of their portfolio and it doesn't really move their asset overall nav by even a small amount so but that creates a good opportunity for uh, you know retail investors who are on the lookout who understand what the new business division does and we just quickly look at some of the opportunities which we participated in the last 3 4 years and you will get a better idea what i am trying to say so the first management change opportunity is a company called swiss glass coat so uh, i don't know how many of you have heard the name of this company So Swiss Glass Coat is India's second largest glass lined reactor manufacturer. What does this mean in any chemical plants the reaction happens in a inert vessel which is glass lined and it is a tech, so to prevent corrosion and collision you know between the chemicals and it is a technically complex product to make and there are very few manufacturers in India who specialize in this. and if you have been tracking the investment world you would have seen the chemical companies in india have been having a fantastic run in, in for the last 7 8 years and most of them were expanding capacities as there is the demand for the products was only growing as globally a lot of realignment in supply chains were happening so while when you expand capacities getting these glass lined reactors is, was sort of a bottleneck because to set up a new plant you need these reactors and vessels and equipments and there are very few people who can deliver it to you the order backlog was as much as 6 to 9 months if you order it today you may get a reactor after 12 months and the business has had power so the indian leader for this segment was a company called jmm fodler and they were you know growing their sales and bottom line i think from 2016 to 18 their bottom line doubled more than doubled but swiss glass coat was stable they were not they were not growing as much and i, I believe the management had succession issues they had two daughters and uh, he was also getting old and uh, he was not as committed to the business he brought it up to a certain size but he was not as aggressive to pursue further growth so now here comes the hle group from surat so they were uh, one of the largest manufacturers of filters which again go into chemical industries so they understood the space very well they were in a, already in an ancillary areas and they were market leaders in that and they made an open offer to acquire this company so they bought 50% 51% stake at a valuation of 62 crores so at overall valuations of the company around 125 crore they acquired this stake and they made an when they acquired an stake they gave an open offer to minority if they want to exit they can exit so let's see what and at the time of uh, acquisition the the management of the hle they said ki from the current turnover of 100 crores we want to take the turnover of the consolidated group to 500 crores within the next 3 4 years that is our vision that is what we want to take and th- these are all public statements and if you think of it if you understand the valuations of capital goods sector as such you have a company which has a 100 crore turnover it's being available at a valuation of 130 crore which is and you have a management new management capable management who is a market leader in its own segment committing or you know taking over the company and saying that they want to grow the business exponentially in the next 3 4 years 
So how are the odds in your favor? What are the odds? Can it, you know, how much can you lose here when you are buying at a, you know, bargain valuations? So if you look at the, so even though they said they would do it in the next three, four, three, four years, it took because of the COVID and some delays, it took them a further time. But they actually did 500 crore turnover within the next five years from 100 crore. So they merged the existing business to it and consolidated. They actually achieved, and the profit PVT was 60 crores last year. Imagine five years back, they acquired the company at a valuation of 120 crores. They paid just 62 crore for this. And the tax, the profit that the company earned last year was 62 crores. And over this period, over the peak period, I think the stock returned over 55x. So from a valuation of 130 odd crore, it went to as, as high as 9,700 9, crores. So this, this was obviously it got as happens in you know any asset cycle, it got overextended. The valuation got out of hand. You know, for even for a you know business doing 62 crores, I can't justify a 9700 crore valuation. But that is the nature of the markets. So one may may not have got 55x returns, but there was enough you know on the ride to make decent money, and we participated in this in a good way. Second management change company is CG Power. Everyone would have heard about this. This was, was in, is one of the India's largest company catering to capital goods in, again, electrical, motors, railways, <coughs> various segments. And this company was hit by financial irregularities by the erstwhile promoter, the Thapers. So they had, they siphoned off some money, they had some financial transactions, so which led to uh, a lot of constraints within the existing business. The business was very good. The market reputation of its products was very good. The customers really liked the product. There was great demand for the, the product, but the company wasn't able to supply because of the issues with the erstwhile management because they have messed up the entire business because they siphoned off the funds from the company. And finally, the bank mandated a management change in, in an auction. And who took over the company? One of the most regarded, well-known groups in India, Murugappa Group, they made a bid for it. And they committed to invest uh, 1,700 crores, 700 crores, and they allotted shares. The shares were allotted to them at roughly nine rupees. And after the announcement came, the stock was easily trading at 11, 12 rupees, and you could have bought as many quantity as you wanted. It was freely available. Now think of it as an in terms of odds. You know the value, the valuation at which it, this transaction was happening was roughly 2,000 crore. This was a business which in its good days did a turnover of 6,000 crore. And you know, it has a lion market share in its segment. The customers really liked it. Now you have a very capable management who is taking over control. So what are, where are the odds? And what eventually happened? Let's see. So this is, you know, where the transaction happened. And in the next, within two years, we have 30x return on the stock. Again, as the nature of the markets, maybe it got a little bit extended here. You know, we have a 4,200 crore valuation today. But last year, this business just 900 crore PBT. Imagine the transaction happened at 1,600 crore valuations. So if one understood the potential of the business, you know, 5,000 crore, if the group is coming in, the turnover would grow. They have, they understand the space well, the new management, they have the capabilities. It is quite possible, one could have, one doesn't know what the future lies, you have to see the potentialities out there, right? It made sense to invest. So, again, spin-offs is when a company is demerging from a larger company and you have a new small entity which is being formed and then you try to evaluate it. So, I'm going to talk about two case studies here where we analyzed and invested in them. The first is green panel. So what is green panel? So green panel at its time was one of the largest Indian uh, MDF manufacturer. MDF is medium density fiber wood. What is that? So we understood plywood, which is made you know, in our all wardrobes, construction doors, construction, and medium density fiber boards are, is an alternative to plywood. They are easier to handle and are cheaper. And uh, almost as strong, if not, I mean, it works for most purposes. It, they are as, as good as plywood. 
globally if you look at the trends mdf consumption is much higher than plywood and in in india it was the reverse and we could see that the acceptance of mdf board in india is just getting prominent you know it is getting more and more accepted and the ratio between plywood to mdf is moving in favor of plywood in favor of mdf right so now you have india's largest pure play listed company you would have a company who had a uh, already an existing plant which was fully utilized it was doing at that time almost 25% ebitda margin which is very high for that this kind of business and it had committed to double its capacity the plant a new plant construction was already happening so there the, it was already under way it was about to be commissioned in next 6 months for which it had taken up debt and uh, and it was overall available to us at a valuation of 350 crore turnover so if we see what happened after listing was so after listing we saw some institutional selling it came down here and it the stock was available freely trading around between 30 to 50 bucks you could have bought as much stock as you could have wanted at that point the only issue with the company was that it had debt on it what are the odds whether this business will survive or not the product is good the demand is very good the brand is very well well renowned and it was available at 350 crore valuation so now in fy22 i think the business last year the business did 240 crore pat a business which was available to us at a 350 crore valuation and within 2 years it did 250 crore pat that was the potential of the business and we had a 20x return within 2 years so just think about the asymmetry right you could have still have made money in one of these transactions it's not that future is uncertain it is possible that you bought it at 30 35 40 rupees and future does not work out and you know the new plant capacity does not get utilized and you know they had to repay debt and they had to sell it at a loss or it goes into bankruptcy that was a possibility but what could you have lost in that right maybe you would have lost uh, say if you invested 1 lakh rupees maybe you could lost 30 40000 rupees on that but what could you have made if it succeeds that is the asymmetry right so 1 lakh rupee investments may made you 20 lakh rupees over a two year period and you may not hold on to the entire 20 lakhs maybe you got it at 5 or maybe you got out 10 but still the asymmetry is fairly big and these kind of opportunities exist a lot more in during uh, special situations because there is no uh, past track past data as an independent entity right very few people are closely tracking it it's newly listed so or not many people are aware about it this so this is another case study arthi surfactants so arthi surfactants was a specialized business which got demerged from a, one of india's largest chemical company called arthi industries arthi industries is a very well regarded large company which has done incredibly well over the last 10 years growing you know significantly expanding capacities gaining market share entering new areas so this was a very small part of their overall business and it did not get ad- adequate focus and which it deserved so the management decided that this is a small part which needs needs special focus we should demerge it and list it as a separate company and with its own management who would grow that business and they were committed to growing this which they also made it clear in their media interviews at at those time and in articles and but this was such a small part of the overall company when the demerger happened the group overall market capitalization was roughly 18000 crore and after demerger when the if you see this was where the demerger happened and for the next 3 weeks you just have large selling because mutual fund managers who were holding the stock they don't care about this stock they were just selling it irrespective of the prices and where it bottomed i think it bottomed at around 250 rupees at that time the valuation was 180 crore now you imagine a company coming from a group such a high regarded group who has most you know in terms of capabilities they are one of the best chemical engineers that they have they have access to all all the talent within the field capabilities they have all the resources there and the reason for demerger is that they they think this is a niche business which needs adequate focus which does not 
get with, which gets lost within the larger company. And they, the entire reason to demerge is to, they want to, they are committed to growing this business to, to, to take it to a new level of potential. So if you buy it at 250 crore, uh, at 250 rupees when it got listed, so at that time the book value of the company was 130 crore. And you could have bought it at a 170 crore market cap. You know, the, the main company would be trading at like eight, eight, ten times book value, which is a much larger business, which can only grow at a smaller scale. This is a very small business, niche business, which is growing. And it was available at almost the book value, slight premium to the book value. And again, here also, they were doing large investments to grow the business. We already knew that they are, they are expanding the capacities. And for this business, what was interesting was we already had a peer which was listed and we could see what kind of profitabilities listed companies in this area were doing. So Galaxy Surfactants uh, was the peer, is the leader in this business and you could see that their profitability is much higher than the what Aarti Surfactants is doing currently. So I as, when I, I as an investor think of it, ki this is a management who understands the space well they have all the capabilities, technical capabilities, financial capabilities, and they are committed to growing their business. And they are putting their capital to work. They are putting in new man, bringing in new management. They are putting in all the focus. If I think two, three years out, is it likely that from their margins would converge towards the industry leader margins? It may or may not reach, but what are the odds? The currently, it is not as profitable, but in my mind, I thought with all this focus, it is possible it may reach there. It may or may not reach there, but if they are currently doing 3 4% margin and the leader does 12% margin, maybe it reaches 7, maybe it reaches 8, but it should move towards that direction, right? So now, look at what happened. So at that time, when it got demerged, it was doing 250 crore sales. Within two years after demerger, they did 462 crore sales. Profit went from 2 crore to 22 crore. And a peak market cap return has we got was 8x return within two year period. And the, I think the story may still play out because you know, uh, over time, this is still a very small company. It may still continue to you know, invest and grow the business. And we will see in future how this goes out. The point to focus on ki asymmetric nature of the payoffs when you are buying at such valuations, at such companies, so what is there to lose and how much can you make when your thesis works out? And if we focus on that, that could help us, you know, decide whether we want to invest or not. But what are some of the things that we want, should look at? You know, what are the aspects to focus on? So these are the things that I look at. Personally, I would want to look at what is the motivation behind a spin-off or a takeover? If, why is someone taking over this company or why is a management company, a demerger happening? And what is the track record of the management? Because finally in a small company or uh, if you are bet, taking a bet, three, four year bet on a business, then the track record of the management is very important, right? And if they have demonstrable track record in the past of creating values, then our base case is good. And finally the valuations. So I would not like to overpay for things. If the valuations are in favor, the valuations create asymmetric nature of payoffs. If the same RT surfactants was available at 1500 crore valuations, it was possible it got listed at that. From a 18,000 crore group market cap, a small business got listed at 1000, 1500 crore valuations. It could have still be there. But then the payoff is not as asymmetric anymore. You know, I could still make some return, but it is not, you know, that great. So that is quite important. And it's not that these, we would not have cases where we would, they would be failures, right? So some of the companies, some of the ideas that did not work. So Omkara chem Chemicals. So this company demerged into two segments. Lhasa was for animal generics and Omkara was a, this was a chemical business. But if you, anyone who has analyzed it would have known that the, the market reputation and the management track record was not spectacular or was not great. So we avoided it because of that and it did not work. Talwalkar Fitness was another uh, business, company which demerged into two divisions, the gym business and the fitness division went separately. But if you go through a lot of forums, even before pre-merger, you would 
see enough reports accusing them of aggressive accounting and not using their depreciation policy accurately and there were various acquisitions. So in such cases, you have to be very careful, right? Ki when the, what, as I say, ki what is the motivation behind doing this and what is the track record of the management? If you are not comfortable with those, then it does not work out. Syntex Industries, as the sir, sir pointed out, so they did large overseas acquisitions of several companies which were fueled by debt. In India also, they did very huge investments in setting up new uh, spinning facilities, if, which if you look at per spindle, the amount of capex that they did was the highest by far in the industry, which does not make sense because when you are making yarn or cotton, you know, it's a commodity. And if you, if you, what you invest in the machinery is far higher than anyone, then how would you compete with them? So maybe they created a great facility, but the odds were not in favor, right? So, and so we avoided them as a merchant. So yeah, they, they are always risk. We have to be careful about them, but it is a fertile grind, ground. And if done properly, so they, they can create you know, good opportunities. So these are some of the live ideas that, you know, recent ideas that are, that are playing out or still to play out. And if we want, we can look at them and study them further. Some spin-offs which have happened is Max India after capital reduction that Gaurav talked about, the healthcare, the hospital business has gone differently. And Max India, they are doing a business of senior living, which is a futuristic business. How does it pan out in future? We have to see, but this is an opportunity. Mirza International is going to demerge into two companies. NMDC is demerging where the steel plant will be different from an ore business. Piramal Pharma just got listed currently where the pharma is a very different business from financial services and now they have two separate owners. So it could be an opportunity. Sundaram Clayton is also a holding company for TVS Motors. So they are doing a, a big structuring where they are going to give away some cash. They are going to list the operating business separately and the holding business separately. So there, there could be an opportunity there. Some of the management change ideas which have happened re recently is DFM Foods. This is the manufacturer of Cracks, a Delhi based company. It got acquired by PE Advent. And uh, I think it is roughly around the same valuations at which PE acquired. It could be an opportunity. Euroka Forbes again got acquired by a PE. I think the price has run up quite a bit, but could be looked at. Ever Ready Industries, this is the battery manufacturer. It was earlier owned by Khetan Group and they had problems in their other ventures and it got acquired by Burmans of Dabur. And now this is an interesting opportunity that, you know, Burmans have taken over Ever Ready. Ever Ready is a good brand. What can they do with it? SCG Healthcare, this is a specialized uh, hospital business focusing on uh, cancer and uh, uh, IVF treatments. They got acquired by a PE and they have been able to turn around the business and uh, we have to see how it goes up. Selen Exploration is an oil drilling business. So they got a uh, management took over who has a past who was earlier I think uh, in the senior management of Kane India. They had a large uh, and they have also a backing of PE. So they understand the space well and they are committed to grow, increasing the production. So it is a potential opportunity one can study. So these are some ideas. I mean, we may or may not have, you know, tracking these or investing in them, but some of these opportunities, which if we want, we can study further.